Welcome to lesson 6.3. In today's lesson, we'll discuss flagellates, ciliates, and microalgae of photosynthetic protists. We'll look at their shapes, the way they live or their lifestyles, and the distinguishing features that these organisms possess that makes them belong to that particular group of organisms. Okay, so let's jump into lesson 6.3. The first thing that we need to mention about flagellates is that some of these organisms actually can become an amoeba. So just depending on the environment that these organisms are in and the way that they need to feed in that particular ecosystem that they find themselves within, they are interchangeable between amoeba and a flagellate. So they might have pseudopodia, like the amoeba pictured here, or a flagellum which is how a flagellate moves. And if you imagine that a food source like bacteria might be available via a very, very tiny pore into an aggregate, it might serve well to have a flagellum and gain those bacteria from within by reaching via the flagellum into that tiny, tiny pore space. On the other hand, if a whole organism can fit through a particular pore space into an aggregate, it might be more beneficial to be in an amoeboid form and enter that pore as a whole organism. So it just depends on the environment, but the one species of organism can actually change between these two forms. And I find this absolutely fascinating. So when we do a soil analysis under the microscope and count amoebae and flagellates, we don't really know whether that amoeba is one that is able to become a flagellate, is it a species that has that capacity at all, and vice versa. So this is something that these two groups of organisms span across many different eukaryotic phyla, and many different types of organisms can have the amoeboid lifestyle and a flagellate type of lifestyle, and specific species can actually have both. So being an amoeba or being a flagellate is actually a lifestyle, a particular adaptation to a particular environment of many different species across very many different phyla, as you would have seen from last lesson when we looked at the eukaryotic tree of life. So from this we can see why it is incorrect to try and group these organisms based on their morphology and why the term protozoa is no longer applicable and why all these organisms are grouped in the protists because they are basically interchangeable. And to try and identify a species based on its lifestyle, whether it be amoeboid or flagella lifestyle, makes it really difficult and inaccurate. So these are just forms certain organisms, certain protists take on in order to be able to live in aquatic environments and soils. Now let's examine a flagellate type of lifestyle. So flagellates move via the flagella. That's plural, flagellum is just one. So we have a flagellum here. It is this extension of the body that allows the organism to move and perform other functions. The flagellate lifestyle exists across all the eukaryotic supergroups that we have seen in the eukaryotic tree of life in the last lesson. They range from 5 to 20 micrometers in size, and they are characterized by having this long, whip-like fine structure, the flagellum, often called the whipping flagellum. This flagellum is mainly used for motility, but also as a sensory mechanism and a way to direct food for ingestion into the organism. The flagellum has been defined as one of the most exquisite pieces of engineering by scientists that marvel at the capacity and the ability of this appendage and just how tiny it is and in terms of its structural complexity. Some flagellates will have just one flagellum, like euglena for example. Up to four is a norm and usually there are two, like Chlamydomonas has two flagella. And anything more than that, and some of these organisms have several of these flagella, it is actually rare to have more than four. There are different types of flagellates that use the flagella 
locomotion, like dinoflagellates, for example, euglenoids and zooflagellates. And you can look these up for yourself if you want to see what all these groups are characterized by and what they do in their function in the environment, if you're interested. There are autotrophic and heterotrophic flagellates. Autotrophic flagellates means that they are photosynthetic, so they actually have chloroplasts and are able to photosynthesize or fix carbon. And the heterotrophic ones are the ones that eat already made carbon compounds, so either by predation or by decomposing organic matter. And some are mixotrophic, so some dinoflagellates have a lifestyle where there's basically an ability to fix carbon or photosynthesize and also be able to hunt by engulfing other organisms. So this is an example of a flagellate moving through space, through liquid, and you can see that it can elongate and also contract as it moves. And cells can actually range from quite rigid to fairly flexible. So this one's a, a flexible type of flagellate, but more or less they maintain constant shape. So unlike an amoeba that is able to put out pseudopodia and completely change shape, the flagellate doesn't do that. It's because it's using the flagellum for locomotion. So it is just a cell that has some sort of an integrity in terms of its shape. So the flagellate is able to, to some extent, modify its shape, but not to the extent that an amoeba does. This is another example of a flagellate when it's really, really round. A beautiful image. So now let's look at ciliates. The diagram shows just the enormous diversity of ciliates. It is absolutely mind-blowing as to the amount of diversity, ginormous diversity of these organisms. And this just shows biodiversity of freshwater ciliates from a lake in China. So just in that lake, there are so many different types of ciliates. These longer ones remind me of the Loch Ness Monster, and perhaps maybe this is what the Loch Ness Monster is all about. But yes, there's huge diversity of how they look and the different species and how they move and just everything about them. Ciliates move via cilia, which are actually also flagella. So these are just shorter flagella. It's apparently the same type of material that it's made out of in the same way that it moves. So ciliates just have multiple flagella called cilia, which are often called eyelashes because <laughs> they're tiny little hairs that go around the ciliate. What's interesting is that unlike the other protists we've so far met, ciliates are monophyletic. So that means they actually came from one lineage of organisms and they only exist within that lineage. They're not a shape or a lifestyle that other organism groups use. Ciliates are actually in their own right an organism group that shares the same phylogenetic lineage. There are about 9,000 species that have been described so far, but there are estimated over 30,000. Most are microscopic, but some can reach up to four millimeters, and they can either have a rigid or a flexible cell. So as I said, cilia are actually flagella or eyelashes, <laughs> and all ciliates will have cilia at some stage of their life. At one point or another, every ciliate species will develop cilia for movement. They vary in length, and they are used in locomotion as well as feeding. They allow actually for very rapid movement. So ciliates under the microscope are just this flash of lightning going past oftentimes. And to catch them is really difficult, but also very fun to follow them around if you can be quick enough. So the cilia may be fused into long sheets of undulating membranes, a series of short tenants, or movable tufts, also called cirri or stiff bristles called seti. And what's really interesting about ciliates is that they have two types of nuclei. 
So there's the macronucleus, so it's a larger, more dominant nucleus, which is polyploid. That means it has multiple gene copies and it determines the cell's metabolism and cell functions. And then there is also the micronucleus. So you can see these two different nuclei here, the macronucleus and the micronuclei. And the micronuclei are responsible for genetics that, and DNA exchange. What's interesting also about slits is that they divide by binary fission. So that means they can just make a copy, a replica of itself. And at the mark of 200 cell divisions, there are signs of aging. So the cell starts to malfunction. It's not as brilliant at its function as it once was. And what the ciliates can do is reorganize their DNA via conjugation. So that means they can actually partner up with another ciliate and exchange and reorganize their genes. And that provides them with vitality and youth and probably extends their lifespan as well. So these are just some of the cool things that ciliates can do. On the diagram here, we can see that they've got a mouth which is called the oral groove where the food enters the ciliate. They've even got an anus. It's designated here as an anal pore. <laughs> They've got their cilia. They have digestive vacuoles where food is digested. So there's a lot of complexity actually in this one cell of the ciliate. And these are just some beautiful scanning electron micrographs of ciliates. This is just one particular species from the book called Terrestrial Ciliates from Australia and some other parts of the world, edited by Wilhelm Feusner and Helmut Berger from Austria. And Wilhelm is one of the guys that really studied ciliates from all around the world and has documented what they look like. So it's worth looking into Wilhelm Feusner because he's a very prolific ciliate scientist. He has passed in 2020, but you can actually download this book and this is volume five, so there are various volumes. But this is just to show you basically just how intricate they are, these creatures that are microscopic, and the detail involved in their design. This is another species from the same book, from Botswana. I can understand why scientists have thought of these creatures as animals, and especially with the scanning electron microscope <laughs> to be able to see such detail. And the fact that they've got these cilia all around their bodies looking like hair makes it really fluffy and cute like an animal. So let's look at the feeding behavior of ciliates. They ingest food via the cytosome, which is like the mouth, and then the food is compartmented into the food vacuole, and then it exits via the anus, which is called cytoproct, which is a funny name because cyto is cell and proct is anus, so cellular anus. Nutrients can also be adsorbed to the cell surface, and when that happens, a process called pinocytosis may occur where there is a small membrane vesicle ingestion. So imagine this membrane engulfing a food particle surrounding the particle and then closing itself off and taking that particle into the cell. So a very cool way of feeding. And also possibly there's osmotrophy, which just means that nutrients are absorbed directly from the surrounding liquid or water, whatever environment the ciliate finds itself in, and then there's osmotic ingestion, so that means the nutrients are actually absorbed via the membrane. This is questionable, so I think there's still questions around whether that's how ciliates feed. But there are also one or more contractile vacuoles within the cell, like for example, this contractile vacuole here, and that's to remove excess water or ions which enter the vacuole via osmosis when nutrients can move from a higher concentration of nutrients to a lower concentration of nutrients. So these are the different strategies that ciliates employ to feed and this image is by Dr. Robert Burden and in the next few slides you'll see more images by him. And if you want to look up his website because he's got some amazing microscopy images of different organisms, particularly ciliates, you can look at the Canadian naturalphotographer.com and he talks about how he 
creates these images and it's just a wonderful website to have a look at. So ciliates replicate like other protozoa that we've looked at via binary fission. So that means they just make a daughter cell, a replica of themselves, and this is how they multiply. However, there's also the process of conjugation, and that's when two ciliates can exchange genetic material via their micronuclei and share that genetic material by exchanging it from one to the other. So another beautiful image of a ciliate and yet another one by the same photographer. This is not an image by him, but I just wanted to show you this image because it's such a beautiful representation when you actually look under the microscope and you see ciliate behavior and how they move. And they'll often sit somewhere quietly without moving, but then they move really, really rapidly from place to place. And it really reminds me of a tiny little mouse zooming around. So very interesting creatures to observe under the microscope. And I highly recommend getting a microscope and just having a look at specifically like water from your pot plants or any stagnant water or soil that's been sitting under water for some time. And you will see ciliates. They're very, very cute little fascinating creatures. Now the last group of soil protists I'd like to talk about are the photosynthetic protists and they used to be called microalgae. So that just means that they're not giant kelps but actually microscopic photosynthetic organisms because they are algae but they're actually protists and so it's no longer acceptable really to call them microalgae because they are photosynthetic protists. So they're able to fix carbon and they contribute to carbon sequestration into soil as a result of their photosynthetic capability. They're quite diverse in soil, particularly in the sunlit layers, because they're photosynthesized, they need to be in the upper layer. And they're mostly associated with cryptogamic crusts, and these are the layers in the desert where other organisms and the photosynthetic protists come together to form these crusts to hold soil in place to create soil in deserts and actually prevent further erosion or erosion of those soils. So they're super important. In the absence of light they can become heterotrophic, so that means feeding on organic matter, and osmotrophic, so being able to absorb nutrients from their environment, from the liquid that they're in. They're a great food source for many organisms, however they are very understudied. There are not many studies at all on these organisms in soils and their function and their role. But one study I'm aware of is that over a seven day period, three to 17% of the total carbon in earthworms and springtails came actually from cyanobacteria, which are bacteria, and from the microalgae or the photosynthetic protists. So that's just an example of their importance in terms of nutrient cycling in the soil and they need to be considered in that. It is also known that up to 80% of the net primary production in some ecosystems is actually directly contributed by photosynthetic protists, but on average in all soils the net primary production from these photosynthetic protists is at 10%. So they are significant contributors to soil productivity. However, they are not considered in food web models. So this is a problem because they are a great contributor to the soil food web. And you can see some of the examples of these photosynthetic protists just here, but also some of the flagellates contain chloroplasts and they are also considered photosynthetic protists. So once again, there's that blurred line as to our descriptions of different life forms. But in general, if we think of microalgae, this is what they look like, and they are very important, but yet very unknown, particularly when it comes to soils. So while microalgae in oceans and other aquatic environments are well studied, when it comes to soils, there is much to be learned about the role and function of photosynthetic protists and particularly microalgae. Perhaps some of the most fascinating microalgae are the diatoms. They are hugely abundant in ecosystems, particularly as part of phytoplankton in oceans. 
and they're actually responsible for 25% of the world's primary production. So that means they provide 25% of the photosynthetic output. And there are many different species of diatoms that live in soils. And there seems to be an endless biodiversity of these organisms. Their numbers are so prolific that the estimates are anything from 10,000 to 200,000 species. And some scientists even say 2 million. So it's just such an abundant group of organisms. And every year new species are being found. They are mostly noted for their extremely intricate designs that you can see here. They are symmetrical in shape, so they create these gorgeous formations. So they basically encapsulate themselves in these silica-based, made out of silicon glass shell called a frustule, and some of them are motile. And they come in all kinds of shapes and sizes. They are just stunning. So it is no wonder that diatoms are also called jewels of the sea. In the Victorian era, at the end of 1800s, early 1900s, there were some artists that were putting these microscopic creatures in various arrangements. And this is a very rare art form these days. But if you want to learn how to do it, there is a great article I found called The Collecting, Cleaning and Mounting of Diatoms. This is just to show you how beautiful these arrangements are. And there is a lot of work to prepare diatoms to look like this and mount them. So you're essentially killing them. And there's all kinds of chemical preparation that needs to happen. But there is a video on this website called Secretive Victorian Artists Made These Intricate Patterns Out of Algae, where there's a man who, since he was 16, he became obsessed with the diatom art. And he basically self-taught the secret art form. He learned it all by himself. He discovered his own methods and is now producing these incredible art works from diatoms. These are, mind you, microscopic. So you need to have a microscope and also be able to then move the tiny diatoms, isolate them, prepare them, and then mount them, <laughs> glue them onto a slide and then take images from that and also preserve the slide. So there's a lot of work that is involved and it is an incredibly tedious job, but the results, as you can see, are just absolutely stunning. So if you want to learn more about these fascinating creatures, particularly with regards to how their shells are actually made, how they actually make these ornamented, beautiful shells in casings for themselves. I highly recommend watching how diatoms build their beautiful shells. And this is on a YouTube channel called Journey to the Microcosmos, which I also highly recommend. And I've placed a link there for you to have a look at this incredible little video and just to get to know the journey to the microcosmos because it is a, just an exquisite collaboration that eventuates in amazing microscopy videos and narration of those videos and you can learn a lot from that excellent channel. But for our purposes diatoms are extremely important as microalgae and in the next lesson we will talk about the very important role of protests in soil, and this will include microalgae in the soil ecosystem. So this is the end of lesson 6.3, and in our next lesson we'll focus on soil protests in nutrient cycling. So we'll look at how the different protests feed in soils, what they feed on, and what that means in terms of nutrient cycling. So you'll be hearing from me again in lesson 6.4. Bye for now.